Great. Um, so today we're going to tap into, I guess, the the physical body a little bit. We're going to talk about Ayurveda and Dinacharya, and we are so um, honored to welcome our very special guest, Shyama. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about Shyama. She was raised in a family of bhakti yogis and grew up around her father's Ayurveda health retreat in North Central Florida. She knew there was something magical about her parents' ways, but didn't know that living and sharing yoga and Ayurveda would also become her life too. After receiving her bachelor's in traditional Eastern arts, she moved mm -hmm. to New York City where she spent almost a decade living and serving at the Bhakti Center in New York City. Um, she, along with her sister and husband, directed two yoga studios in the East Village, the Bhakti Center and Stanton Street Yoga, where they taught in-person trainings on yoga and Ayurveda to hundreds of students each year. She now lives in Alachua, Florida, and her whole life of teaching has moved online, teaching weekly classes and 100-hour and 200-hour trainings in both yoga and Ayurveda online has opened up the classroom to students around the world. Um, and I'll just say a personal note about Shyama. She was one of the first um, devotees that I reached out to on Instagram when I was interested in learning a little bit more about bhakti, and she invited me to the Bhakti Center in New York to my first Thursday night kirtan and was just so sweet to talk to me after the kirtan and introduce me to the community there. And I can just tell she's such a light and everything that she does is in service to, to Guru and to Krishna. And she and her husband and family are so dedicated. Um, so thank you so much, Shama, for being here with all of us to share your knowledge um, and your light and love that you share with everybody. So <laughs> I'll leave it up to you how you want to run this. Um, I'm sure, will you have some kind of presentation or do you wanna just, you will, okay, great. So I will make you, are you a co-host? Let's see. She is, she's a co-host. Okay, great, great, you are. Okay, wonderful. So I'll pass it along to you, Shama much, Victoria and Tiffany, for hosting this amazing Vaishnavi Sangha. As you were announcing um, kind of the purpose of the Sangha, like bringing devotee women together, my heart started beating because I was like, oh my God, this is, this is so special. And of course, I knew that's what I was joining. But um, yeah, being in all of your association via Zoom uh, feels very special. So thank you, Tiffany and Victoria, for hosting the Sangha monthly. And Victoria, I think we were emailing almost a year ago trying to schedule this, right? Was it almost, yeah, you know? almost six months or something time, like that? <laughs> time goes so fast. And I'm just happy to, to finally be here with all of you. So thank you so much. And I'm just going to, I like to see you. I know many of you are, um, I'm just seeing your names, which is totally fine if you're more comfortable or that's more appropriate for you at this time. But it is always nice to see you. So if you feel open to it, please put on your camera at, at any time. And like Victoria was saying, my name is Shama, and I grew up with two wonderful parents who are both disciples of Srila Prabhupada. Um, it wasn't until later on in my life where I realized how special this was. Of course, uh, like many children, we're not, you know, thinking our parents are the, the coolest until, <laughs> until a little bit later. Um, so, so I feel very, very fortunate to have both my mom and dad in my life. My dad also shared the whole world of Ayurveda with me and my sister Diana. Um, again, at the time, I didn't always feel that this was the coolest thing. Um, I remember my dad, as a young girl, he would sit me down and he'd teach me the alternate nostril breath, which we'll do a few minutes together very soon. And as he would teach me these things, I just thought, this is so boring. <laughs> How could anyone do this? <laughs> and it's taken me some time, but I am realizing how wonderful these practices of yoga and Ayurveda are. And some of you might be like, I know what yoga is, but I heard this word Ayurveda, but what is Ayurveda? So uh, yoga and Ayurveda are considered to be sister sciences, meant that they're supposed to be practiced together. And yoga is the spiritual science that comes from India, which all of us practice bhakti. And Ayurveda is the medical science that comes from India. So as uh, devotees of Krishna, of course, we have the greatest treasure, the spiritual science of, of getting to know who we really are in relationship to God, to Krishna. 
And along the way, if we can be healthy on a physical level, it's, it, can be, it can be very helpful. Of course, we all have different karmas, but, uh, but the practices that we'll be speaking about today will enhance your life and your vibrancy and, and your energy throughout your day and your tasks. So let's start uh, by chanting the Guru Mantra together just to invoke auspiciousness followed by the Maha Mantra. And we'll just do a few minutes of pranayama breathing techniques to, to center in. So you wanna gently close your eyes. And notice any thoughts in the mind. Of course, the nature of our mind is to think. So we wanna give it something uplifting to think about. Taking a deep breath in. Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Malitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhaira Shri Vasari Gaura Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And wherever you are, if you can, if you're not driving your car, let's close the eyes. <laughs> you know, Tiffany says she's in the car. And with your eyes closed, Take a very full breath in through your nose, filling the lowest part of your belly, the mid belly, all the way up to your upper chest and your lungs. And as you exhale, empty chest, mid belly, low belly, all the way down. So this is a full yogic breath. We're gonna take three of these breaths. We're inhaling low belly, mid belly, all the way up to your chest and your lungs. And exhale, empty chest, mid belly, and low belly. And take two more breaths like this. So the breath is a tool that can help us quiet our mind. And as we quiet our minds, we become more present to this very sacred and beautiful moment. As bhakti yogis, we understand the greatest gift of each moment. We're going to do the alternate nostril breath and I realize some of you this is all very familiar and some of you might be brand new and this is just meant to help us to become a bit more centered before we go into the topics. So for the alternate nostril breath you're going to take the peace fingers of your right hand and place them just inside of the eyebrows almost like you're pushing a button and then your right thumb will cover your right nostril. Let's inhale through the left side completely. Cover both nostrils as you hold your breath. And then exhale right side all the way. Inhale right side. Cover both nostrils holding at the top. And then exhale left side. So that's one complete round. We'll do two more together. Inhale left for four, three, two, one, holding at the top, and exhale right, four, three, two, one. Let's inhale right for four, three, two, one, holding at the top, and then exhale left for four, three, two, beautiful. One more time, inhale left side, Holding at the top, exhale right side, inhale right side, holding at the top, and then exhale left, place both palms down, keeping the eyes closed, just take a few final deep breaths in and out through both nostrils, so that Alternate nostril breath is balancing for both the left and the right hemisphere of the brain. Our left hemisphere being more logical, able to grasp information, our right side being more intuitive or creative. 
both sides are very important. And then as you're ready, you can just open your eyes. And again, I'm only seeing some of you, so thank you for <laughs> thank you for your camera. So, so Ayurveda, Ayur means life and Veda means knowledge. So when we're studying Ayurveda, essentially we're studying the, the knowledge of life uh, based off of the five material elements, earth, water, fire, ether, and air. And we see that these elements make up everything in the material world. So if you're looking out the window, whether you're in New York City or you're where I am, I live in Alachua, Florida, we live in the forest. Everything outside is made of matter. Everything in your home is made out of matter. And as devotees, we also understand that our bodies, they're made out of matter. So Ayurveda is the study of these five elements and how to bring them into balance. Uh, an important thing to note is that there's not a one size fits all in Ayurveda, which I find so wonderful. Uh, I know uh, when I was younger, I would look at health magazines and one magazine is saying be gluten free and the other magazine is saying just do lemonade and cayenne and maple syrup for 10 days. And another magazine is saying do this or do, and it, it can be very confusing on a, on a health level. How do I take care of myself? And Ayurveda is saying, you know what? Maybe that diet will work for Monica, and maybe that diet will work for Victoria, but not for you. So it's quite empowering science because we actually have to get to know ourselves on a physical and also internal level. And uh, we can get to know ourselves. We might know, hey, I'm not hungry. I shouldn't eat anything. But then there's the discipline of actually not eating anything when we're not hungry, right? So there's the empowerment of knowing, oh, I'm hungry or I'm not hungry. And then there's the discipline of, okay, how do I take care of that cue from my body? And um, yeah, again, it's just, it's very personal for everyone. So I'm going to share a screen with you, which is, I think here. Can you guys see, Victoria, can you see it? it says Dina Charya. Yes, you can okay. see it. And I'm gonna go ahead and just put it in here. Okay. So uh, this word Dina Charya, it translates into daily routine. Dean means day and Charya is habits or rituals. And what we're going to be speaking about today, they're actually very simple practices. You've probably heard of them before. And it's something as simple as like scrape your tongue every day. And you might be like, hey, I, th I thought I was going to get something really profound out of this workshop. Um, but these simple practices, when practiced over many days and weeks and months and years, they become very profound for your health in the long run. So you might have tried a, a healthy habit in your life. And if you do it for one day, you're gonna feel the benefits immediately. If you do it for one week, those benefits become even greater. If you do it for a month, if you do it for a year, those benefits continue to increase. And then you get deep realization of maybe something very simple, like taking five breaths before eating a meal. So, so these practices, again, they are very simple, but when practiced over a lifetime, they're, they're meant to give profound results. See how I go to the next screen. I think. Oh, there we go. Is that the next one? Yes. So, regularity. When I was young, this word regularity, consistency, stability seemed so boring to me because I thought, you know, life needs to be exciting and fresh and change every day. But what I found as I've grown a bit older, I'm still in my mid 30s, but that stability is and regularity is one of the foundations of, of health. And in one sense, again, it could be monotonous, but there should be certain, uh, certain steady practices that we have every single day without fail. Like for instance, eating your meal every day, whether you're someone that likes to eat two meals or three meals, those meals should be at the same time every single day. So that regularity is gonna allow your body as a functioning machine to work much better. 
So it gives our mind somewhere to settle. If I know when I wake up in the morning, I should drink fresh water. Um, it's gonna give my mind somewhere to settle because I could choose something else. I mean, I'm not really a soda or a coffee person in the morning. I used to be in college. I used to love drinking coffee in the morning. If I had the choice, maybe I'd choose coffee instead of drinking water first, but coffee can be um, very dehydrating. So of course it's not the best choice in the morning. So we're starting here with a percentage or I like to call it wiggle room because we have an idea of what our perfect lifestyle might look like. Maybe you've written it down before. I know I have journals full of like 7 a.m. do this, 7.30 a.m. chant all my rounds, 8 a.m. go to the temple, 8.30 a.m. read Shema Bhagavad. It might, you might have like everything perfectly written down, but the reality is life happens. Um, now I'm a mother of a one and a half year old, so my daily routine <laughs> looks very different than um, than what I've written in my journal before. So wiggle room, it's important. Um, where are you in your life and how much can you commit to your health routine? You might be at a place where you have a lot of space and time and you're gonna do 80% and the 20% of wiggle room means I'm gonna wake up Monday through Friday at 6 a.m. before the sun rises and Saturday and Sunday I'm gonna sleep in. Or you might say, I'm at 70% or I'm at 60%. Whatever that percentage is, is going to be unique for all of us. But it's important to acknowledge that there is space to, to fall off track a little bit. If I did my breathing practices today, maybe I can take a little break tomorrow. So again, it's going to be different for everyone. So hopefully by the end of this short presentation, and we're only together until about a little after five, I'd love for everyone to have an idea of what is your commitment to your, to your health? And our habits, our habits, our health habits, our Instagram habits, our uh, TV habits, our Joppa habits, whatever habits we have, they show us what we value most in our life, whether it's conscious or unconscious. If I get home after a long day and I just lay on my bed and start scrolling through Instagram, which I've had those days, <laughs> raise your hand if you've had a day like that, you're just scrolling through Instagram, unconsciously I'm saying I value Instagram more than maybe finishing my rounds right now or reading the Bhagavatam or reading the Bhagavad Gita. If I get home and I can see what I'm doing with my time is showing me what I value, I just remind myself that I might choose something that's more uplifting. So we're talking a lot about habits today. So the three main cycles that we recognize in Ayurveda, and again, Ayurveda means life and Veda means knowledge, are the cycles of the day and the daily clock, uh, the seasonal cycles. There's different elements that will affect uh, winter, spring, summer, and fall, and the life cycles. Today, we're mainly going to speak about daily cycles, so Dinacharya, as well as the daily clock, how Vata, Pitta, and Kapha will be uh, affecting us throughout every single hour of every single day. Oops, let me go to this image. And senses, we hear a lot about senses in the devotee world, mostly control your senses, <laughs> that's what I remember growing up hearing. and. Um, in one sense, I almost felt that senses were a bad thing because in the devotee world, it's sometimes like, oh, you just speak about senses as these things that are totally out of control, which in one sense, they can be, right? These senses can completely distract us from the meaning of life. But at the same time, these senses help us to experience this world. And how grateful am I that I have ears to hear and I have eyes to see and I have a mouth to taste. Of course, as devotees, if we can learn to dovetail and use our senses to take us closer to Krishna, that's ideal. So we're gonna speak about how to care for our senses, and then we'll go into an ideal daily routine. So these are the five major elements as per Ayurveda, earth, water, fire, ether or space, and air. And each of the elements is connected to a specific sense organ, which is uh, connected to an ability that that sense can do. For example, the earth element is connected to the nose and 
it's connected to smell. So if you if you live in the city, you can't really smell the earth so much. I as I as Victoria shared, I, I lived in New York City almost 10 years. When COVID came around, uh, we actually just moved down to North Central Florida. So now we live in the forest after like 10 years of New York City living. But now if I take a deep breath, I can smell the earth all around me. Water, the water element can be found in the tongue and it gives us the ability to taste. If you've ever had a very dry mouth, you can't actually taste what's on your mouth. Fire, fire is said to be a pitta organ that's in the eyes. So with light, we can see. Without light, we can't see. And air, um, the air that's moving, it allows us to touch or to feel. So if there wasn't the air element, you could touch, but maybe not feel. And space is um, connected to the ear, which allows us to hear. And I was recently hearing a class um, on end of life, and I didn't know this, maybe some of you already do, but the, the hearing, um, element of space is actually the last to leave when we're leaving our body. And I was thinking, how amazing is that since we are, um, since we understand that chanting the holy name and hearing the holy name is the most beneficial thing that could possibly happen as we're leaving this body, that Krishna gives us the opportunity to hold on to that sense the longest. I thought that, that was so amazing. So these five elements, as I was sharing at the beginning, they create everything in this material world, everything outside of us, and then this physical body as well. So let's briefly talk about that so that makes a little more sense for you. So the earth element is the foundation of this body. So our muscles, our bones, our tissues, our ligaments, the earth element makes the structure of this physical form. The water element in the body, sweat, tears, saliva, blood, urine, um, Anything liquid that comes out of this body is because of the water element. Fire, the fire is the digestive system. And you'll often hear in Ayurveda circles, someone might say, how's the fire of your digestion? Meaning, are you digesting your food? And are you able to digest your experiences as well? Air is um, movement where space is what's holding or kind of like the container. So an example, Victoria's in California, I'm in Florida. So that distance is space. There is that ethereal space between us. But if there was some air, <laughs> if it was possible that we could both feel the same air, that would be kind of what's moving inside of the space. So in, on a physical level, if you think of the stomach, for instance, there has to be space in the stomach for our food to digest. And the air is what moves the food around or will move circulation. So we see how these elements create this physical body and we all have all five elements but just to different amounts so someone might have more earth element than perhaps air and how this could show on a physical level is maybe an earth element person just has more weight or maybe it's it's just easy for the earth element person to add weight to their body where air no matter how hard you try to make air heavy it's not heavy it's a light element so someone that has mostly air is going to be very light in their body. They might be very thin or skinny, no matter how much they're eating, their body is just naturally composed of more air. So from these five elements come vata, pitta, and kapha. And I don't want to confuse you too much. Um, so I'm just giving a very broad general uh, explanation of Ayurveda. But then vata, pitta, and kapha are comprised of these elements and then the whole science of Ayurveda is, is meant to, to balance out the elements. If you're feeling too heavy, what do you do? You bring in the opposite, you bring in lightness. If you're feeling too hot, what do you do? You bring the opposite, you bring in more coolness. So it's quite intuitive. And um, I've studied Ayurveda from teachers where it did feel very overwhelming and almost complicated. And then I've also studied from teachers who make it seem so, uh, so natural, because it is in one sense. Uh, so Ayurveda is so simple that a child could understand it, yet it is so complex that we could spend our whole lifetime going deeper and deeper and deeper into the science. But I like to, especially during our short time together, think of it in a very childlike perspective. If you look out your window, how do you see these elements working right outside? 
For me, um, I'm in North Florida. It's very humid. It just rained, so there's a lot of water. Um, it's also hot. The sun is almost always shining, so there's a lot of fire. And it's kind of swampy. <laughs> there's that earth and water swampy feeling. So I can see those elements. Before I lived um, in New York, which was a different experience of the elements, and before that I was living in Colorado, there was a lot of space element. You're 5,000 feet high um, where I'm used to being at sea level. So anyways, no matter where you are, you're going to see that these elements are are working in, in a different way. Oops. Um, can you still see me? Victoria? We're seeing your desktop now. Huh. Okay, well, this is my husband's, just so everybody knows. I don't know what he has going on here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but let's go back. I don't know why it just disconnected. He has good stuff going on here. <laughs> I'm just going to exit out because I don't know what's going on. There's a picture of Brenna saw me in a taxi in New York. This is a picture that he took. Um, and it's so cool because it says purity right there on the building. So it's like a very oh, wow. artistic. Oh, wow. That's so cool. All right. Let me see how to get back to what we were doing. Oh, there we are. Okay. Right. We're seeing it again. Okay, perfect. <laughs> So, so yeah, you're seeing these elements play in different ways, and that's how you can you can understand Ayurveda in a very childlike way. So there's one formula, like, well, there's many formulas, but one that's very important is like increases like and opposites create balance. So if you're going to think or take anything with you today, I would say that's the Ayurvedic formula to take. And in many ways, it's quite intuitive. Like increases like. If it's a very cold winter day, and you go inside your house and you drink an iced tea, you're gonna get more cold. Like increases like. Opposites create balance. If it's a very cold winter day and you go inside and you have a warm cup of tea, you'll find balance. So that's a simple formula that's used, um, that's used in very complicated situations and also very simple situations that hopefully you can just bring into your life. If you wake up feeling heavy, how do you bring lightness into your life? If you wake up feeling light and anxious and scared and fearful, how do you bring a grounded energy? We always want to bring the opposite to find balance. Okay, so moving to the senses. We're going to talk about the senses and then we're going to go into the, oops, the daily routine. Let me just check the time. Okay, so starting with the ear. So I'm just going to read this to you. If anyone has any questions, you can let me know, but we're kind of just reading it together. So you can apply a small amount of sesame oil to your fingers and massage the oil all around the ears and in the outer ear canal. And this is especially helpful in the winter months when the ears are exposed to cold and dry air, or if you had a day of traveling. And then another way to care for your ears, of course, is to be mindful of the type of sounds that are entering into your ears and the volume. I've also had a treatment before where the therapist will put my ear on the side and actually pour sesame oil directly into the ear, which feels a bit scary at first, but uh, the feeling of it um, internally was so relaxing. I felt like so much of my mind chatter just became quiet. So it's very calming, especially for vata, which is a combination of, of ether and air. That's a nice way to take care of the ears. Skin care, abhyanga. So the skin develops in the embryo at the same time and from the same tissue as our nervous system and brain, which is a pretty cool fact. Because if you've ever received a massage or even if you've given yourself a massage, you'll feel that your entire nervous system just feels more relaxed. Your mind even becomes quiet during a massage. So you don't have to get a professional massage in order to receive massage every single week. And in fact, most time a bhyanga or self massage is done um, to oneself, by oneself. So a bhyanga, it, it literally just means self oil massage. And the word oil in Sanskrit is sneha. And the translation of sneha, it means love. So a bhyanga or self massage infuses your body with love. And I'm just going to read this. It helps dryness. And as you rub it in, it affects the nervous and the lymph system. 
It will rebuild strength and stability into the nervous system and creates a layer between our nervous system and all the external stimuli so that we're not as affected by it. So if you have ever practiced Abhyanga regularly in your life, it in one sense feels like you're putting on an armor of protection to whatever the day is going to come. If you, especially living in New York City, it's like putting some nice oil on, taking a shower, going out into the world, it feels really important to, feel, to come from a centered, balanced and, and grounded place. The way you can do Abhyanga, it's nice if you can actually have an Ayurvedic oil. Some nice companies are Banyan, Botanicals. My dad also carries an, a beautiful line of Ayurvedic oils. His place is ayurvedahealthretreat.com. You could buy oils from his website, or you could also use a plain sesame oil. And you wanna use a food grade sesame oil because anything that you put on your skin ends up in your bloodstream within 20 minutes. So anything that you put on your skin, it's just as, you might as well just put it in your mouth and swallow it because it's gonna end up in every single organ within 20 minutes. So I have a rule in our home yeah, whatever, whatever sort of oil we're using, essential oils or body oils or lotions, that it's something that I can read, I can recognize, and if I needed to, I could use it in my kitchen <laughs> while, while I was cooking. So um, the way you do it, it, it's ideal actually if you can warm up the oil. So uh, if you've ever boiled chocolate before, or carob, <laughs> I don't know, Some there's a whole controversy of chocolate or carob. If you've ever um, boiled it and melted it, it's something called double boiling. So you'll have a pot of water and then a stainless steel bowl with the chocolate chips. So that's how we're actually gonna um, warm up the oil. You put the oil in the stainless steel bowl and once it gets nice and hot, you can pick it up and take it into your bathroom and just sit on a towel. And you're gonna rub the oil very generously on your body you're gonna always move towards the heart, long on the limbs, and then circles on the joint. Long on the limbs, and then circles on the joint. And you can do the whole body in five minutes or less. It sounds very luxurious, but it doesn't take a lot of time. And if you can, you can leave the oil on for 20 minutes. If you don't have enough time, even five minutes. Um, and then take a shower to get the oil off of your body. So what the warmth of the oil does is it opens up your pores and allows the herbs in the oil to go deeper into all the different tissues. And what's really wonderful about Ayurvedic oil specifically is it's balancing for your unique body type. If you have a strong vata constitution that goes out of balance very easy, maybe you're using a vata oil that's gonna bring more balance to you than maybe it would for someone that has more of a strong kapha constitution. But those herbs, they're gonna go into the tissues and nourish you. And they also have the potency to um, release or extract toxins at the same time. So that's why the heat of the oil is so important because without heat, the pores could stay closed. But with the heat, the pores open and the oil goes very, very deep. That's the same thing with a warm shower after you put the oil on. The warm shower, or the steam from the shower is also going to open up your pores, allowing the oil to go nice and deep, deeper, 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 and also to release any toxins that, um, that perhaps are found in your body. And you can use soap in the necessary areas like your armpits, um, but I wouldn't use soap on the rest of your body just so you can leave a thin layer of the oil on your skin. And then after you get out of the shower, just pat dry. And you'll, it's not, you might think like, why would I put all this oil on and then wash it off? You're still gonna feel the oil on your skin, um, especially if you're not using soap and then just a gentle pat. So um, one more unique thing about uh, Ayurvedic oil, the way that it's made is usually equal parts water and a base oil, very often sesame, and then a lot of herbs, a lot of medicines and put on a very low flame and stirred. And traditionally mantras, healing mantras were chanted to the oil as it was being cooked. And then once all of the water is evaporated, you have a very thick herb, delicious oil. It literally um, smells so good, I sometimes wanna eat it. And then you'll just strain out all the herbs and then you have this infused oil that really is medicine. It's not just, again, it's not just luxury, it, it is medicine. 
And a lot of these self care is sometimes people will say, well, I don't have time for self care or, you know, why, why take so much care of the body? But in the long run, it's actually by doing these things, it's like your insurance. If you don't have to always have insurance if you're doing all of these things um, to prevent disease, because this is a lifestyle to prevent illness. In the West, we often start taking care of ourselves or going to the doctors when there's a symptom or we're sick. But Ayurveda is the science of taking care of yourself even when you're healthy so that you don't get sick or you don't get the illness. And of course, life happens. We live in a very different age. Sometimes we take perfect care of ourselves. I hear this all the time. Someone that's eating organic and, you know, then cancer comes or this comes or that comes. So, of course, all of that in some ways is out of our control. But this is a, a wonderful way to show Krishna that, that we're doing our part in taking care of, of this sacred body that he's given us. And then just a little bit more um, of the benefits the benefits of a bhyanga or a self-massage and I'll just read a few of them with you um, nourish the entire body decreases the effects of aging imparts muscle tone lubricates the joints increases circulation and go ahead and just read down by yourself and then at the bottom like I was saying the oil quality is very important um, these are a few options. Uh, in, the, in the summer months, coconut oil is actually said to be a, a cooling oil. So here in Florida, it's hot. It's already really hot. So I'm not using sesame oil anymore because sesame oil is very warming. So coconut oil is more appropriate. If you're somewhere where it's quite cold, then continue using sesame. And actually, let's just skip the mustard seed for now. And then this is a quote from the Charak Samhita. The body of one who uses oil massage regularly does not become affected much, even if subjected to accidental injuries or strenuous work. By using oil massage daily, a person is endowed with pleasant touch, trim body parts, and becomes strong, charming, and least affected by old age. And I have a wonderful example. My, my dad has been doing self-massage ever since I can remember. I was sharing with you at the beginning. When I was young, I would see him doing all these things and just think, how boring, what's the point? But now I can see in the long run, it's really paid off. He's such a deep, beautiful person and devotee, and he's in really good health. He's helping so many because he's taking care of himself for such a long time that he still has the strength to serve so many. And I see that even when he doesn't have time to do a full body of yanga, he at least massages his feet before bed. And if you've ever received acupuncture or acupressure or marma therapy, you would, you'll find that um, all of the organs, they have points in the hands and the feet. So if you give yourself a really good foot massage, in one sense, it's just as good as giving yourself a full body massage because you're pushing all of those points in the feet. So at the very least, before bed, take a minute to massage your feet um, again, right now I'm using coconut oil, so I just have a small jar of coconut oil next to my bed. And even with a one and a half year old, I'm finding time to do this. And then I get a pair of socks and I just put them on my feet and I end up taking them off in the middle of the night just because it gets a little hot. But the socks help your bed from getting too oily. All right, so let's speak about eye care. Hey, Shama, there is a couple of questions from oh, Monica yeah. in the chat. She says sesame oil versus regular oil, which I think you covered. Okay. Um, just the benefit of, of sesame oil, I suppose, is the question. And then skin brushing before. Oh, because I didn't speak about the skin brushing. Um, yeah, skin brushing. You can get a skin brush at CVS or Walmart. I don't know where you are in the world, but it looks like a big toothbrush. And this is specifically good for kaphas or to release any stagnation or heaviness. And same as the abhyanga, you would do long on the limbs and circles on the joint. And you could do that before an abhyanga because it, sometimes it'll make the skin a, a little bit rough. Is there any more, Victoria? Yeah, thank you. Um, Paula is asking what coconut oil is best. Mm -hmm. um, any oil that you would eat 
is good enough for your skin. So I buy my oils. If I'm not buying specifically an Ayurvedic um, oil, I'll just go to the cooking section and buy coconut oil from there. But organic is always best. I've noticed that sometimes the sesame oils that you get that are edible, they have a very, very strong sesame yeah. scent. And for me, that was, I, I was like, I got sesame on my clothes. I got sesame in my hair. I was smelling like sesame and I, I couldn't handle it for a while, but then I ended up getting the body and botanicals oh, one. Yeah, it was a little bit more mild. It smells so much better, right? Yeah, sesame oil yeah. does have a very specific smell to it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Jai Radha is asking, when we apply oil massage, the clothes get oily. How do you put well, that? Well, that's the, ideally, you'll, you're taking a shower um, right after. So for me, I'll, you know, wear maybe my bathing suit or like a bra and underwear when I go into the bathroom and do my massage and I'll sit on a towel. And yeah, when you're, when you're practicing Ayurveda, it's hard to not have oil somehow all over your home on the doorknobs on the, on the bathtub so it does take a lot of cleaning but maybe if you have a specific shirt or shorts that you wear when you're doing your yoga so you're not kind of getting everything oily thank you so i care oh sorry and you all can sorry i just wanted to say feel free to unmute yourselves and ask questions as well if you don't have to put them in the chat, but if you want to, if that's more convenient for you, please, whatever is more convenient. No, no, it's Sorry, okay. Sam, go ahead. So I was just saying that I care, especially in this last year since COVID came, uh, I know I've been on the computer way more than I was ever used to. And I imagine many of you probably are in the same boat. And what a blessing it is to stay connected. And even something like Vaishnavi ministry, this wasn't happening before COVID, right, Victoria? Or was it? It started right around when COVID okay. took off. Yes. yes. <laughs> so it's such a blessing that we have these different ways to connect with each other in different parts of the world, but also it is taking a strain on our health and our eyes. So some very nice, simple ways to take care of your eyes is to use rose water um, and spray it directly in your eyes. And this could be uh, while you're taking a break, maybe you work from your computer and you just need to take a break, you step away and spray some rose water. Uh, you want to make sure that it's a rose water with distilled roses. So if you get a rose water with essential oils uh, drops and you spray it in your eyes, it's probably going to sting. So you want to make sure that it's distilled roses, which basically means they uh, will lightly boil uh, rose petals until it's kind of dissolved into the water and then the rose petals are strained out. Um, if you don't have access to rose water, cold water in the eyes is also wonderful. Um, holding cold water in your mouth also helps to alleviate red eyes. So when I wake up in the morning, I usually go right to the bathroom and I scrape my tongue and I'll just splash a little bit of cold water in my eyes and then hold it in my mouth just a few seconds. Ghee in the eyes. Um, well, there is a special treatment in Ayurveda called Netrobasti, and maybe you've seen pictures of it before where you make a dough dome. It's almost like a donut. And you put it over, uh, it's best to have a friend or a therapist do it on you because it, I've never tried to do it myself, but they would put it around your eye, just like a donut, and you'd open the eye and the therapist will pour warm ghee on the eye until it's, it's totally under the ghee. And then you would open your eye and it's very blurry from underneath, but you can still kind of see, but everything's through this yellow tint. And what the ghee does is it's... Uh, it's nourishing for all of the tissues of the eyes. It's so deeply relaxing. And this is actually good for any sort of ailment that's from the neck up, whether that's mental stress or anxiety, or again, um, vision or anything that's going on up above the neck. So usually you'll hold the oil from 10, 10 minutes or so on each eye. And every time I've had it done, I'll do one eye at a time because it just kind of makes more sense um, balance wise. And this is a treatment where I was very scared for so many years to actually get it done because it just sounded so invasive to me. And after I received it, I, I, I never realized how much stress I was holding in my head and my eyes until the stress was gone. 
So this is a treatment that you can very easily do with a friend. Um, I'm sure there's videos on YouTube, or if you have a special Ayurvedic um, clinic in your area, you could go and receive Netravasti. Sometimes it's done with just plain ghee, which feels very nourishing. I also had it done once in India with very bitter herbs, which was quite painful. It was hard to even keep my eyes open under the ghee, but the bitter herbs were meant to take some of the excess fire out of my, out of my eyes because I, I just started wearing glasses a few years ago. I was prescribed to do the bitter herb ghee for 10 days, but I could only do it for one day because it was just so uncomfortable. <laughs> Um, and then, oops, and then kajal. Kajal, of course, it looks beautiful. We see it even in the children when we go to India, but it's made out of ash, camphor, and ghee. And if you haven't put it on before, it's quite a wonderful experience. If it's real strong kajal, it almost has that eucalyptus effect where the eyes will start to water immediately, which starts to release toxins from the eyes. So it looks beautiful, but there's actually a medicinal reason why even the children will wear kajal in India. All right, so we just have a little bit more time. So I'm going to go through these last two, and then we can just briefly look at the full day. Oops, I'm having trouble just- We wait uh, till the end for questions, Shana. It's up to you. Because um, there, there was a bunch that came through just in that last section. Okay. But yeah. I think one that you can answer right away, what's the spelling of that process with the- um, the I. And okay, so it's called Netra Basti, N like Nancy, E T R A, Netra, and then Basti, B A S T I. And okay. yeah, it's very good for eyesight, but also just for headaches, tension, anxiety, insomnia, all of these things. Well, there were some other questions, but I'll hold off until the end and then. Okay. Maybe you Sorry, want to get I'm not through these the questions, but thank you for reading them to me. Oh, sure. <laughs> so mouth care. Um, one that I highly recommend if it's not already in your life, pictured here is tongue scraping. It removes toxins on the tongue from the gastrointestinal tract. And um, it's just a whole new level of oral hygiene. Gargling is also wonderful for mouth care. Um, if you're feeling a, a sore throat, if you're feeling a cold, you can add different herbs or spices in the warm water. For instance, with a sore throat, you might add a little bit of salt um, or a little bit of turmeric. Um, if you're feeling like your mouth is very dry, maybe you're gonna add a little bit of sesame oil. So depending on what's going on, again, you have to address what's going on and bring in the opposite. So again, if my mouth is dry, I bring in oil. If my mouth is oily, maybe I bring in dry. And then oil swishing, um, which is essentially like gargling, except a little different because you're literally just swishing oil in your mouth for 10, 15, 20 minutes. And um, my favorite in this case is to use coconut oil because I have found coconut oil to be very whitening for my teeth. And I didn't even realize that there were products um, I've been seeing <laughs> pop up on my Facebook page of whitening strips for the teeth that are actually made almost primarily of coconut oil. So I just thought I had the secret of coconut oil making teeth white, but it turns out that it's happening. People are already, people already knew that. And then sesame oil is wonderful also for the mouth because um, sesame is a lot of calcium and our teeth are needing that calcium for strength. So good for the teeth, but also good for the gums. And let's just read a little bit um, above the benefits, it creates a saponification or detergent effect that deters bad bacteria and plaque while supporting healthy gum tissue as a barrier against bacterial exposure to the bloodstream. And you switch the oil in the mouth, I already spoke about this, 10 to 20 minutes. And um, the oil consistency will change in your mouth. It almost feels a little more like foamy or light um, you want to make sure to spit that oil. I spit it in like a, in a jar that I may be throwing away or recycling or just spit it out in the forest um, because if you continuously are spitting oil into your drains, eventually it's going to clog up and we know that from experience. So as much as you can, keep oil away from the drains. And the best toothpaste are astringent and bitter rather than sweet 
we see in a lot of American toothpaste, they're very sweet tastes. And sweet is anabolic in nature, which means it grows or it adds. So um, you could find that there's more bacteria growth with the sweet taste, whereas astringent and bitter um, will take away bacteria. So if you go to an Indian market, naturally you're seeing neem toothpaste, which falls in that category. So most of the Indian um, toothpaste are actually astringent or bitter. All right, nose care. Um, neti pot, which is pictured here, it's good for allergy season, traveling, if you're not feeling well, or if you are feeling well, um, it's just a nice practice to have. It cleanses the nasal passages, relieves mucus, and keeps pathogens from gripping. So especially during this time of COVID, um, I've had many friends that just swear by using the neti pot to keep the whole sinus cavity um, clean. And the way you can do it is, this is actually a very beautiful picture of a neti pot. Mine is just like a simple little plastic thing. But if you have something that's beautiful, that's wonderful. Um, fill the neti pot with warm water. If you're feeling mucusy, then you can add salt. That's what I have written here. But if you're already feeling very dry, you wouldn't want to add salt because then that will create more dryness. So you could always put a little bit of oil. And if you haven't seen this done before, um, I would say just look it up on YouTube so you have a visual. It's a little uncomfortable and awkward at first, but essentially you're just putting the oil in one nose and it actually comes out the opposite nostril. Once you do it, it's, it feels okay, but you might just wanna see a picture first. And then you can blow your nose um, and it feel very clean. And then Nasia, this is a wonderful oil. You can also order on Banyan Botanical. You could also order from my dad's website. Again, ayurvedahealthretreat.com. And Nasia is a specific herbal concoction um, where you'll put these drops into each nostril. And this is something you can do by yourself. I love to do it at the end of the day when I just kind of want to relax. You lay down um, five drops in each nostril. Each drop represents one of the elements. And there is eucalyptus in most blends of Nasia. And then a lot of them are also a base of sesame. So it's going to be really nourishing for the whole sinus cavity. And you'll feel it kind of just traveling. And sometimes I even feel a tickle in the back of my throat. And it just opens up the sinus cavity. Um, Nasia is good for insomnia. It's good for anxiety. It's good if you have headaches. Um, what are other conditions? Any, again, it's one of those things that anything from the neck up, any condition, whether it's emotional, mental, or physical, Nasia will be very helpful. And Shubha then, was asking about, I'm sorry to interrupt, Shubha was asking about how to help folks with migraine. This could be one of those things. Oh yeah, Nasia really could be very helpful. And also the naturopathy that we were just speaking about could also be very helpful. And yeah, these are therapies that I would maybe watch them on YouTube and I, I'm, I'm not a doctor and I'm not signing waivers, but yeah, if you, if you, I would say they're easy enough to do at home. If you're, as long as you have very clean ghee for the eyes um, that doesn't have any food or any bacteria in it, just a fresh bottle of ghee and then the nasya, it's super easy to do at home. And then the Kapalabhati, we did Nadi Shodana Pranayam um, to start, Kapalabhati is breath in and out through the nose. <laughs> this is really also good for cleansing out the nasal cavity. All right, I think, okay, good. So that was all the senses, the sense care. And it is, yeah, and as, as we take care of the senses, we're really honoring these wonderful gifts uh, that Krishna has given us to, to experience and and view our life more clearly. Okay, so let's just look at an ideal daily routine. And this is a simplified version because I don't want to overwhelm, but I think many of you are probably already practicing many of these. And then we'll have some time, yeah, then we'll just have maybe a few minutes of questions. So ideally you're waking up before the sun and we all understand uh, that energy before the sun rises, the Brahma Mahorta hours are said to have so much more spiritual potency that's available for our sadhanas. And our sense care. So we just went over all of the sense care. Uh, choose one, choose two, choose them all if you're very motivated. 
but we're in this for the long run. So rather than doing them all tomorrow and then all for the next week, and then when it comes to July, just dropping everything, I would suggest just choose one new thing, maybe a month, and then see how that goes. And then add the next new thing, because otherwise there's just so much and it definitely can be overwhelming. But you know, if you aren't scraping your tongue yet and you just say, I'm gonna order a tongue scraper right now, uh, then that just becomes a part of your life. And when that feels totally normal, say, you know what, I'm gonna try to get some rose water and start spraying my eyes. And slowly you're doing all of these things regularly. We're in it for the long run. Warm water with lime or just warm water is really wonderful for getting the digestive system going and having a hopeful bowel movement in the morning. And when we're releasing, um, when we're evacuating in the morning, we're releasing yesterday to be ready for today. Um, morning meditation, japa, reading, maybe go to the morning program, and then breakfast. So an ideal breakfast is uh, stewed apples. And stewed apples are incredibly easy to digest. And the way you make them, and you might eat more after the stewed apples. If you're like, that sounds like I'm not enough to eat. This might just be the start of your breakfast. Um, you'll peel the apple skin, cut the apple, and then lightly boil with a few cloves. And what the clove does, it'll start to uh, ignite your digestive fire, uh, wake it up for the day to come. And the apple is actually considered a prebiotic. So it's very healthy for the gut flora and the intestinal wall. So it, it's very helpful for your digestive system. I was one of those people that I could skip breakfast very easily and not be hungry until lunch and then kind of snack. And then, you know, I was just had at some point in my life had very bad eating habits, very irregular. But once I started doing apples in the morning, it just made me hungry and ready for lunch. So you can really feel how it ignites your digestive fire. And when we wake up in the morning, our digestive fire is sleeping because at night you don't need it so much. It's a very small fire. Um, so you wanna build the fire just as you would one in your backyard, starting with small twigs and then with larger sticks and then eventually big logs where that's like the lunchtime. Um, if you start a fire just by putting large logs right away, the fire is going to go out. So the idea of the, the apple is it's like the little leaves, the easiest thing to digest to start getting your fire going. And I swear by this, it's such a simple thing, but it will completely change your digestive system. If you have irregular evacuation, you, you know, eating the stewed apples in the morning, even after a week, you might find that your, your body is digesting a lot better. So this is one of probably my strongest Dinacharya practice right now. That and tongue scraping are my two favorites. And then contrary to American belief, lunch is the biggest meal of the day. At the same time every day, be hungry and don't overeat. So as much as you can have breakfast at the same time every day, a little wiggle room, maybe 30 minutes or an hour. Lunchtime is at the same time every day. Dinner is at the same time every day because our bodies function like machines and they'll start to expect food at a certain time, which means the digestive system is already working. It's already turning on, it's waiting and then it's doing its job. And then dinner is meant to be light, simple and easy to digest. A nice example could be a simple soup, maybe a piece of toast with your soup, uh, maybe some nice mushy kitri, just something that's not so filling for your body. Because at night when we sleep, our body's actually doing a lot of work to regenerate itself for the next day. And our liver, it acts almost like a, a janitor, a very friendly janitor. It wakes up about 10 p.m., which we should be sleeping, and the liver is gonna just start doing its job. It's gonna go and make sure that everything's clean. And if your liver sees that there's a big piece of lasagna from dinner that's trying to be digested, it's gonna say, you know what? They're busy right now, I'll come back tomorrow. So then the organs won't be able to properly cleanse. So that's why it's important to have something very light or a warm cup of ahimsa milk for dinner could be very nice as well. And then having some time that you say, okay, I'm turning off the computer, I'm turning off my phone, I'm gonna retire from this online world 
um, and hopefully bed before 10 p.m. So that's a very simple version of uh, a balanced and full day that I think is practical and doable for most of us, I think. And, and lastly, and this is just general, to spend some time in nature every day. And that might mean just taking off your shoes in between meetings and walking on the earth for a few minutes. And it's said that 20 minutes of walking barefoot on the earth can pull out electromagnetic frequencies from the body. And if we're spending a lot of time on the computer or on the phone or on Zoom, we, we really need that. And literally hugging a tree does the same thing. So not only hippies hug trees. If you hug a tree, it's pulling out the electromagnetic frequencies that you've been surrounding yourself um, maybe at work during the day. So I'm going to stop sharing and um, then Victoria, if you see any questions or. Sure. Well, it looks like Vandita, you have your hand raised. Do you want to ask a question? Yes, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I'm a high school student in my senior year. And oftentimes I have to either like stay awake during the night, a whole night study or get up really early in the morning. And um, I'll have to eat snacks either to keep myself awake or because I find myself to be hungry. So what can I do that I can eat or do to keep my digestion healthy and also keep my acidity in control? Hmm. Well, I know college day, you said college, right? High school. Oh, high school. oh man, you're not even at college yet. You're already doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry you have to study so much. That's too much. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I Ayurveda for thousands of years has been recognizing how important it is for us to tune into mother nature's rhythms. So to stay up throughout the entire night is, is not staying in connection to mother nature's rhythms. Um, so it's not recommended, but if you have to, you know, simple snacks, like maybe dates and almond butter, or like dates can be very grounding and maybe warm soups if you're feeling hungry throughout the night. I see. Thank you so much, Mataji. I would say, say stay away from cold, um, like smoothies and salads and have more, more warm and nourishing meals. Is there anything like specific I should stay away from to keep like acidity in control? Um, any like spicy or like tomatoes. Um, I'd say stay away from those two things. Spicy and tomatoes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Mataji. Thank you. Good luck. I hope you don't have to stay up so late much longer. <laughs> Thank you. There is a question from Shreya. She said, I used to have thick hair until I was about 20, but my hair started thinning afterwards. It's fine now, but not as thick as they used to be 10 years back. I'm 30 now. Can you tell me what would be the Ayurvedic reason and some remedies for hair fall? Yeah, and I mean, there could really be many reasons. And sometimes just aging, the hair will start to fall out. But uh, you could massage your head maybe with sesame oil or coconut oil, depending on your constitution. And anything that's good for the bones is good for the hair. So if you're um, taking more sesame seeds, maybe sprinkling it on your kitchen or your soups, um, that could also be really helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a question from Paula. What if we work on eating at a specific time, but we aren't hungry even after some wiggle room? Yeah, there's always wiggle room. So if for some reason, like maybe, maybe you had an occasion, maybe you're at a program and you ate a big dinner. So the next morning you're not feeling so hungry. So that might be a special occasion and you decide I'm going to skip a meal. So, but it's, but in general, you want to have um, that regularity. But yeah, my dad would always say, if he's not hungry, he does skip a meal. Whether I'm hungry or not, though, I, I always do my stewed apple in the morning. Because again, that's like putting the little leaves and the little twigs on the fire. So in the long run of the day, it's going to be invoking and, and invoking the fire more than putting it out. But if you're not feeling hungry on a regular basis, there's something off balance because hunger is a sign of health. So if for some reason you're just never feeling hungry, that means your digestive fire needs some attention. So please make sure that your digestive fire is being taken care of. 
We have a comment from Archana saying thank you so much. Hare Krishna, Dhamma Pranam, very wonderful, useful tips. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Oh, now, now I um, see the Paul, question. Uh, yeah, my screen the was chat. on, I couldn't see it. Um, um, you can put any spices with the clove or with the apples, but cloves specifically are good because they are heating, but they aren't going to overheat you. So, like if you eat a chili, you might feel the heating effect on the body and the mind and feel agitated. Um, where cloves specifically will ignite the fire, but they're not going to make you feel very hot. So that's good. I like putting cinnamon. Sometimes I like putting cardamom. Yeah, there's not like hard and fast rules about how to put spices on your apples, but every spice does have a medicinal effect. Is it wrong to not? To not put cloves? Is that the question? Hare Krishna. I, I, <laughs> I clicked before I sent. Is it unhealthy um, not to wash the oil off you when you've had a a massage. I've been mass self massaging with sesame oil for about a year and a half, but I've not never washed it off. I keep it on. Okay. And do you do it at night before bed? In the morning. Okay. And it, I guess it's not enough oil that it's getting all over your clothes or affecting no. you. Okay. No. Well then, yeah, then that's okay. Um, okay. Yeah, that's okay to keep it on. I mean, if you're using, the, there is the benefit of taking a shower if, if you are taking a warm shower because the pores will open more and the oil will go deeper. So there is that benefit. But if you're feeling healthy and finding that it's helping you, then I'd say that's fine too, the way that you're doing it. Thank you. Thanks. Shamai, I, I actually... Oh. <laughs> I actually read um, your sister's book, Ayurveda, Mon Ayurveda Mama, um, and was really inspired by that and how during pregnancy, um, just the body changes and therefore the needs of the body shift even according to Ayurveda too. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know, um, since you have a little boy, in, when you were pregnant, what was something or that, what was a way that your self-care routine changed? Mm -hmm. Well, pregnancy was really funny for me because I thought I would be doing everything right. <laughs> but all I felt like I couldn't do yoga. My body just didn't want to. And I, yeah, so self-care, I was resting a lot more. Like that's probably the biggest change for me. I was just tired, tired, tired. That's funny because I, I gave my sister, when she was pregnant, she was pregnant before me. And I gave her all these tips from Diana's book. And I said, you should do this and this and this. And she's like, okay, okay. And I was like, why is it so hard for her to do that? And now I'm feeling the same way. Like I feel just so tired and not really able to do so much and yeah. <laughs> do everything right. Yeah. Like now I, I totally get what you're talking about. Yeah. I feel like the tiredness that you, that I felt while pregnant really prepared me for the tiredness of <laughs> <laughs> what's to come <laughs> okay <laughs> no but but it's totally worth it mm -hmm. great well i don't see any other questions in the chat but if anyone has any more questions you can unmute yourself and you can ask yeah thank you all so much for joining it's it's i feel grateful for the opportunity to be with all of you and i hope it was somewhat helpful even when one little tip. And is it okay, Victoria, if I share my email with everyone just in case they have yeah, questions? Absolutely. So I'll put my email in the chat um, if you do have any questions. And yeah, like Victoria was sharing, my sister, my husband, and I, we offer 100 hour, 200 hour trainings in yoga and Ayurveda. Um, our next training starts the end of July. It's called Ayurveda in the Kitchen. And you can't really practice Ayurveda without practicing it in the kitchen because. We eat every single day. Um, so learning to apply the practices and the lifestyle with our food and our diet. So I wanted, is it okay, Victoria, if I, if I offer a discount to everybody here? Of course. It's, it's, yeah, if anyone's okay. interested, just email me. Um, I wanted to, I was meant to email you before, but I wanted to offer everybody a special discount to that training Thank if you. you're interested. Thank you. Thank you so much. I do have a question, if that's okay. Of course. Um, I've been oil pulling for like, like seven years every morning, 
And I have always oil pulled first, then brushed my tongue, then brushed my teeth. Mm -hmm. Recently, someone said to do something different. I'm wondering what <laughs> what your view is and what the proper yeah. order might be. Hmm. I, I do it similar to you. That's how I do it. It just feels most natural to get the rest of the oil off. <laughs> but I, I imagine that whoever said something to you has a reason why they they do it like that. But I do it the way you do it. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Where are you guys? Three ladies together. We're in California. We're not far from Victoria. Oh, so you guys know each other from California? Yeah. From New York first. Oh. Yeah. And are you three roommates? No. no. <laughs> I, I, taught, I taught a yoga class in the park this morning and then we're reconnecting after being apart. Oh, fun. <laughs> Thank you for joining us here. <laughs> Carly also does a lot of service with the Vaishnavi ministry. Oh, cool. Um, there's a, a question, another question from Paula. Does tongue brushing not have the same effect as tongue scraping? Um, tongue scraping is like a whole new level. And if you haven't tried it before, you'll, you'll just know after doing it that it's much more effective than the brushing. I agree. I can attest to that. <laughs> it opened I up a whole like, new world for yeah. me. <laughs> There's like modern toothbrushes. I've seen them at CVS where they have like a little brush on, on the back. And I'm like, it doesn't even compare. Um, Shreya says, can you suggest something for post-nasal drip? Post-nasal drip. I, I, is that, I don't even actually know what that is. So I don't know if I could suggest it. Is it when like you just have drops in the back? I think it's like a um, mucus when you get mucus and like. And it drops. And it drops into your. Okay, I can see what it sounds like. Um, yes. I, I don't know enough about that, but maybe you could, I would imagine that Nasia is helpful, but maybe research first, what we were speaking about earlier. Um. Um, yes, a tongue scraper is, I believe, is available on my dad's website. I think you can also get them on Amazon yeah. or like yeah. a lot of stores, even like Whole Foods carries them now. Yeah, yeah, they're very common now. Hot flashes. Um, so that same formula, like increases like and opposites create balance. So if you're feeling heat in the body, you want to bring more coolness. So this might be from the quality of food. You could have a hot kitri in temperature, but use cooling spices. Um, you might take like a peppermint bath to keep your body cool. Um, stay away from hot, spicy foods. So just bringing as much coolness into your body and mind as possible for hot flashes. Um, I would like to ask a question. First of all, I want to thank you. I'm Ratu Manjari. I'm living in Amsterdam, Holland. Wow, how are you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so okay, so I just decided I want to stop chocolate because okay. I was really getting completely, you know, it was like a brown thread in my day, you know, it became really important mm. and I just want to get over it. And uh, so can you suggest anything like why does someone become so addicted to that and, and what could I eat or do to just kind of calm down easily from it? Well, good for you for noticing that and having the strength. It's just so boring, you know, to eat the same thing and just see that I'm a slave to this now. And this was, mm. not, it's not the idea. Mm. So, mm. Thank you for sharing. Well, have you heard of the six tastes of Ayurveda before? Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, yes. pungent, and pungent. So coffee and chocolate are actually a bitter taste. Mm. So that's sometimes it's said that I, I know you're in Holland, but I'm speaking American that because Americans are in such a coffee culture. It's like people just drink coffee. And I've heard it said by Ayurvedic doctors that it's because we're lacking the bitter taste in our diet. We're craving it. So we're only finding it from coffee and chocolate. So mm -hmm. if you can find other ways to bring that bitter taste into your palate, and that could be green leafy vegetables or dandelion greens, you might find that you aren't craving it as much. Okay. Is it a dark chocolate or a sweet chocolate? Oh, yes. Dark. dark. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you're craving maybe that bitter taste. Yeah. That is actually true. And that, that was, that was, that's nice. That bitterness. Yeah. yeah. 
together with the sweet, of course. But yeah, the sweet is, and sometimes, you know, the sweet taste, because each of the tastes also have like an emotional response. So sometimes I know if I'm feeling like I just want some love and affection, I'll, I'll want to crave sweetness. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, there's other ways to find love and affection besides from chocolate, believe it or not. <laughs> I'm Absolutely. speaking to myself. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's true. That's also what I noticed. It's like, yeah, it's from childhood, you know. Mm -hmm. I know where it comes from. And I've worked on it and I've worked on it. And maybe now I can do this. Because I really, I had read some things that Shira Prabhupada said about chocolate, which were, okay, it's a no. You know, yeah. I don't know what, who, what everyone else made of it, but right. whatever he said about it was clearly no. It was clear. Yeah. So I didn't want to know that, but I looked it up just to yeah, help. Please don't say that, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank so, you for sharing. I'm sure we all have something, you know, that we're attached to, and you just well, sharing that helps helps all of us. Thank you so much for that bitter tip. It's good. Thank you for the message. Well, thank you all so much. I know, Victoria, remember I told you I have to go because of my little one. Yes, yes. Um, Please feel free. I'm sorry, we we went a little. No, <laughs> I I I don't even want to leave. But yeah, I thank you. Yeah, so every, just so everyone knows, my little boy. I I, I told him that I would be back at five fifteen, so I'm just a few minutes over. But I, it's hard. To, <laughs> it's hard to leave you. But Victoria, you said you guys would continue the conversation, right? Sure, sure. We'll stay on for a little bit longer, and I'll just give everybody some updates about what's happening with Vaishnavi Ministry. But please feel free to to head out. And thank you so much for being here for all of us and sharing your your knowledge and wisdom. Thank you so much, Jai Prabhupada. Jai Prabhupada. <laughs> and thank you so much for having me. And, and hopefully next time we connect, your little one will be here. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> hopefully. Hi, Bo. Thank you. Hi, Krishna. Hi, Krishna. Thank you. Hi, Krishna. Hi, Krishna. Hi, Krishna. So for those of you who are able to stay on, um, if you want, we could have some time for some association. Usually we, we take this to two hours. Um, and it's, sometimes it's just nice to get to know each other, to talk, um, just to have some positive, uplifting association. We can talk about things that, that we've heard and um, studied recently or any, pretty much anything, um, get to know each other. But if you don't want to stay, that's also totally fine. I will um, just let you know that we have a couple of things going on with Vaishnavi Ministry North America. Uh, about a month from now, we'll have another Vaishnavi Sangha on Zoom like this. I don't have the details yet, but I know it will be uplifting and um, positive as always. <laughs> and, um, and then we also have our Bond of Love interview series. I don't know if, if, if any of you have had a chance to catch these interviews that are happening twice a month, but they're really fantastic interviews with um, each of Sri Prabhupada's female disciples. Um, many of them have been interviewed in the book, Bond of Love, Sri Prabhupada and his daughters. Um, and it, they're, they're fabulous. And Every, after every interview, we do upload it, make sure it goes directly to our YouTube and um, it is live streamed on Facebook too. So please make sure you catch those every other Saturday. We should have one coming up soon as well. So I just wanted to let you know about that. And, um, and that's pretty much it. So I guess we, we can stay on if you'd like. <laughs> Feel free to, to stay or drop. Hi, Rati Manji. Hi, Krishna. <laughs> Saruni, I must be um, so late for you now. Huh? <laughs> yes, I'm going to take rest now. It's late. Okay, so thank sure, you sure. very, very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Priti, Shubha. Hey, Krishna Priti, can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Hi, Krishna. 